Hi again and welcome to the Talking Bass Podcast. This week Ellen is sitting down to talk bass with one of the most successful session bass players of all time, the great Nathan East. Nathan is probably most famous for his work with music legends Eric Clapton, Michael Jackson and Phil Collins, but his CV is ridiculously long and prestigious, having worked with artists as diverse as Al Jarreau, Kenny Loggins, Stevie Wonder, Herbie Hancock, Joe Satriani and Daft Punk. He's also a member of the band Foreplay and released several solo albums. In this interview, Nathan discusses his musical background, his approach to baseline creation, and also talks about his touring gear of choice. So, without further ado, let's join Ellen as she sits down to talk bass with the legendary Nathan East. Hello, and welcome to the Talking Bass Podcast with me, your host, Ellen O'Reilly, and my amazing guest guest today uh, is Nathan East. How are you doing, Nathan? Fine, thanks. How are you doing? You're in London? I'm, I'm actually, right now I'm in Ireland, going back to London in a, in a few weeks. Oh, okay. Uh, kind Beautiful of all Ireland. over the shop. Yes. Yeah. It's with the coronavirus and all that, like, you know, all my work vanished. And so I was like, oh, I might as well just go back to, you know, chill out yeah. in, in the country of Ireland. Yes. In the countryside for a couple of months and end up being a year and a half. But now work's coming back, so I have to go back to London. So that's Unbelievable. Yeah, I know the uh, travel has been pretty restricted oh. uh, over there. And we, we're just we're just now getting loosened up here, too, so. Anyway, Nathan, I always like to know where it all began with, with great bass players. So, like, did you did you grow up in a musical family? It was a musical family, but, um, you know, nobody professional, but we always had music around the house. We had a piano. We all took piano lessons. And um, so it kind of started from there. And then you, you hear music, you know, playing throughout the neighborhood. And I don't know, we were just drawn to music. And so you're from you're from California. So I mean, what happened then? I mean, so music was around you growing up, but like no one was really playing anything. Well, a little bit, but yeah, you know, um, actually born in Philly, and then my father came out to California for one of his uh, jobs that he was a, a design engineer for a General Dynamics conveyor. Uh, so he was in the, uh, in the aerospace industry. So that took us to San Diego, which led to uh, you know uh, a lot of fun experiences there and we had seven kids um and so you know I, I was influenced by just music that i would see on tv of course the beatles came on and i grabbed a broomstick and started playing along uh, my brothers played my older brother david played guitar my my eldest brother ray was the singer we we were in church then when the folk masses were uh, starting up so we would we would go and write music for the liturgy and then play for the Sunday services uh, around town, around town of San Diego. Oh, that's great. And and then when did your introduction to bass happen? So actually it was it was when I was uh, in church kind of tagging along with my brothers and there was a bass on the altar. Nobody was playing it. Nobody claimed it. And so I just picked it up out of curiosity and started playing. And, and that was the moment that changed my life forever. You know, I fell in love with it. And um, never really looked back. And, and then, so once you started playing bass, what happened then? Like, did you go and study music or, or uh, what was the tra- tra- trajectory? <laughs> yeah, I pretty much joined every band that I could. And, you know, we, we had a band, kind of a garage band back then. And then I, in high school, I joined the, the pep band, the stage band, marching band, you know. So, so I just just totally got uh, immersed in music and and then later studied music at uh, UC San Diego and um, got a degree in, in music there. And was that like contemporary music or jazz or what sort of course? It was, was it? Mainly, mainly classical study um, on the uh, contrabass and then, but then there was some jazz and, and gospel. Uh, one of my instructors, Cecil Lytle, was the, the head of... Uh, one of the music departments that that he, he introduced uh, African rhythms and, and and we had a gospel choir there as well and and a jazz band. So then I started kind of that. That's where I just started, you know, getting all my genres together. And then I studied contrabass under Bert Turetsky, Bert Turetsky there, and um, so you know I just wanted to get my ducks in a row for when I was going to either move to LA or start, you know, in, in the real world. 
where, you know, reading music was going to be an important challenge and, and uh, just mm -hmm. trying to have all the tools in the toolbox. Yeah. So you were like, as soon as you started playing bass, you were just like, this is what I want to do. I'm going to go full tilt with this. Absolutely. You know, just kind of without looking back. And, and I thought, you know, I, just, I love it too much. And so after your course, uh, did you move straight to L.A. or what happened? So, yeah, I started a master's program and, and both my professors suggested that I move to L.A. And, and try to, you know, try to jump in there into the real world. And so I did that um, right at the end of 1979, officially kind of started working sessions in 1980. And um, in, in L.A., it's kind of like it was it was, uh, you know, all the players were established. But then when you when you're the new guy, you know, the. If the word gets out, then your, your phone starts ringing. So that that was pretty cool because I, I worked for some people that were very uh, instrumental in, in helping me, you know, get out there. Gene Page, who was arranging a lot of music, including the Jacksons and Elton John and Whitney Houston, Barry White, you know. So he started calling me for all of his um, all of his sessions, you know, which which was a, a blessing. That's great. Like I mean, so you move straight away and and and. I mean, I've I've done it myself. I've moved from like one country to another country and into a new city and all that. And it's like, it takes a while to kind of get anyone to to get noticed. So like, that's amazing that it kind of happened very quick for you. You know, the timing was very very um, fortunate because I think um, I think some of the guys that were playing a lot of the sessions maybe kind of moved on, moved out of town or. Uh, moved up, but there was there was a kind of a slot that that opened up, and and uh, so I was happy to to walk into it. Brilliant! And then once you started doing those sessions, then of course you started getting more and more calls for bigger, bigger and bigger artists, and then touring. Yes, um, you know it was it was kind of like you know, and and that's what music is. It's it's a business of stepping stones. You know, you just you know you do one thing, and then it leads to another. And so, yeah, I started getting calls to go out on tour. And um, I remember, you know, some of the first tour and I did, I, I went to Japan with Lee Rittenauer in 1981. Um, then I got called by Al Jarreau to join his band, toured with him, got called by Kenny Log Loggins to join his band. And then as it progressed, um, I can remember, you know, get, getting the call from Eric Clapton to, to go out and join the, his band and do some touring. So uh, touring and recording just became a way of life for me. How do you like manage that balance, you know, because you could go off and tour and be gone for months, you know, how do you, how do you balance yeah. your life? Cause when you come back, it's like, Oh, what now? <laughs> I know it's, well, it, it is a, it's, it's a bit of a balancing act because a lot of the guys that were really, you know, hardcore session musicians didn't want to leave town because then you leave and then they say, Oh, who do we get to replace him? And then they never, never call you back, you know, but um, what I was doing is just kind of establishing relationships and kind of two different lifestyles, you know, the, the, the road life is one life, like you say, sometimes you don't see your bed for months at a time. You know? And then, um, and then the, the studio life was great. But then again, same thing you did in, I was telling a friend, we used to work around the clock, you know, through the night, um, three, four in the morning, in the studio and, and uh, not so much these days, but it was, uh, it was just kind of like you were just doing whatever, whatever was available and, and lots was going on in the eighties uh, and nineties. So how do you, uh, how do you see the um, session scene changed now? Like over the years from when you started in 1980? Yeah. Not, now it's, it's changed to instead of a lot of major studios, there's, there's only really now a handful of big, studios in this town left, you know, United, Capital, um, um, Record Plant, uh, and, and places like that where uh, the village, where, where there's still kind of big established, say, corporate rooms. But then nowadays, you know, everybody has their laptop and studio in their bedroom and, and uh, sort of home studios. And, and so you get a lot of that and just kind of passing tracks around. So we're always happy when we 
go into the studio and there's a band and we get to go on the floor and make music, you know, like the good old days. And then you uh, branched into um, producing then. When did, when and how did that come about? Yeah, I always enjoyed producing. I, I remember uh, producing Gail Ann Dorsey's album, Corporate World. Uh, that was one of the, my first productions uh, around the 80s, mid, mid to late 80s. And she was a joy to work with, fellow bassist. And, and we had a good time actually working in London and, and Bath and England. Uh, recording with her and and it just it's just a fun process to to be able to implement your ideas of course when we formed the band for play uh, we all became the producers for our records and uh, so that was early 90s uh, i can't believe 30 years ago already and, and 14 <laughs> albums later how does it work then if you've got like four producers working on the music does there ever get you know wires getting crossed or anything no Usually it's, um, if, if you brought the song in, then you produce your song. And um, so that's usually kind of how the, um, the chain of command works. And then, you know, then once we record the song, everybody just inputs their ideas to make, make the record that everybody hears. But yeah, that's, that's our thing. If we, whoever the uh, composer of the song is, pretty much produces his own song. Um, you've also had a, an opportunity to, to write with many huge artists, like including getting a, like Ivor Novello for writing Easy Lover. And that, well, I love that song. So, oh, thank you. I love it. Like, how did it, um, you know, getting to write with these artists, how did that come about? Well, you know, um, a lot of times it's just a creative process in the studio. That that particular song we we wrote in the studio um, sort of at the end of the project when everything was recorded and we kind of said, oh, we still need something like that could be the, the first single, you know, or undeniable single. So it's kind of like the, the whole mission was to write something that was, uh, that, that, that would hit and resonate. So, uh, uh, thankfully it did. That's amazing. Like you're, you're in the studio costs a fortune and it's like right we, oh, we just need to write a new single let's just do it <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's kind of the way it happened i mean the studio is once you have the time booked you know nobody you know there there may be a set list of songs but really it's up to you what you're going to do so if you're uh courageous enough to to attempt to write in the studio and then that was interesting because it didn't take much more than like 20 minutes to get the 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 bulk of the of the form of the song together. So, I mean, needless to say, that doesn't happen every day, but when it does, it's it's magic. Yeah, absolutely. But um, you've worked with some amazing artists, like legendary artists, like, you know, Peter Gabriel, George Harrison, Phil Collins, Daft Punk, BB King, like the list goes on and on and on. Have you ever, have you ever been starstruck? Well, always, <laughs> you know, like, but at the same time you realize especially in the studio environment. But, I mean, everybody's kind of the, the same. Everybody, most of the people that I've worked with, very humble, uh, genuine, fun people and, and down to earth, you know, kind of normal, regular <laughs> folks. You know, we, we break for lunch, you know, tell a few jokes. And, and uh, so it's, it's very civilized in that environment, you know, as opposed to, you know, the, when you see on stage and everybody's, you know, kind of bouncing around and, and doing their thing, but in the studio environment and in general, you know, it's fun to just get to know people and you realize that, oh yeah, just another cool, regular guy mm. or girl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I listened to an interview uh, with someone before, I, I think it was John Bon Jovi and he said, you know, all the more successful people are always the more relaxed down to earth because they're established they're relaxed it's it's fine they're not and, and they yeah. probably find it really refreshing when you're just being normal with them and you're not being oh my god <laughs> right i mean you know when you're when you're at the dinner table after a session with michael jackson i mean there is a little you're going that's michael jackson right across you know that eating and then you know telling joke and just jokes and just kind of having a good time but yeah the people that don't have much to prove are, are very down to earth and and uh, it's fun because that's a side that I feel kind of blessed to see that a lot of people don't get to see. So what's the like secret to your longevity then in, in terms of 
in touring, you know, because um, because sometimes it happens like people get certain people on a tour and personalities clash and that sort of stuff. Is it? Because you seem like the, like the loveliest, calmest guy. Is, is personality oh, play you. a big part in that? <laughs> well, you know, you got to learn how to, you have to know how to get along with people. And, and I, I can remember reading an article about, that Quincy Jones said, you know, like when he did We Are The World, check your egos at the door, you know. And, and he also um, just said, I'd, I'd rather have a guy that's not quite the player, but a nice guy, as opposed to a diva that comes in and, and disrupts my session. So, um, you know, really, it's a, it's a big community, like a family, you know, and especially tours, because you're, you're together 24 hours a day. You're either traveling, uh, rehearsing, performing, sound checking so uh, it, it behooves you to you know for to get along and, and uh, i've been in situations where there was a little dysfunction and it makes for a long day but playing with so many different artists and so many so much variation and different genres in music like um it's just amazing that you know to be such a good player to be able to play absolutely every, every style you know uh like what's your secret to that well like I said, kind of growing up, we we listened to everything. So you know, you had you had the Beatles going on in there. You had Marvin Gaye, all the Motown music, you know, just blasting through the streets. Uh, uh, I had you know West Montgomery and some jazz playing. My father loved Barbara Streisand, so we you you know we just had um, sort of a an eclectic group of records just being played and and music going on at, at all times. So I I think it really set me up so that I'm, I feel very comfortable in, in either one of those genres, you know, pop, R&B, funk, rock and roll, you know, having listened, I mean, I listened to Cream. I used to be in my room playing Jack Bruce bass lines, and, uh, you know, as a kid with the black light poster in the back and the lights off, incense going. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, it's, it's fun to, um, actually experience playing those those songs you know with with the actual artists what would be your like go-to setup when you're when you're touring well i i have my touring rig which is a tc elect tc electronic blacksmith amp head um with um four or eight four by twelve uh tc electronic cabs and then i i have a radial engineering direct box in there um and it's a very pretty, pretty simple, pretty simple rig. Just um, you know, not not too many effects, and just uh, that. My my, uh, I use my in ear monitors made by Sixty Four Audio. We have some signature ones called the Nates, and uh, those are always those are always nice because they they have you know all these drivers, nine drivers, so I can hear the bass and drums really, really clearly you know, and solid, especially when you're coming through these little buds. Uh, mm. And then uh, we use the um, Yamaha um, signature bass, five string VBNE2. And then um, my strings are the Jim Dunlap super bright strings. And uh, mm. it's a pretty simple rig though. So uh, how did you come up with the design for your signature bass? Yeah, I was, even when I was growing up, you know, I had a, a Fender jazz bass that I was taking pickups in and out of all the time. and always trying to work on the sound and when I got together with Yamaha actually in uh wow it's 40 years 40 years ago now it's 1981 um we started working on bass designs and and you know the string spacing whatever felt really good I kind of used the jazz bass as a as a starting point for spacing and then we tried lots and lots of pickup configurations and pickups until we came kind of came up with a sound that would work um sort of across the board in genres and and uh, so that we had the first kind of version of the signature bass and then now we have the bbne2 which is the second version of it and it's it, it served me well yeah so that's your main main axe that's my main axe and uh go to and so that's the one i play live a lot and um a lot of the ones i mean i i love i love all the instruments you know that I've ever played, you see a lot of mine <laughs> back behind me. And, uh, you know, some good people send me basses and uh, 
the Daryl, and, you know, yeah. lots, lots of good companies that I have friends, friends all over. And, and so it's, it's just fun to, I, I enjoy their like little babies. Um, I can also see a lot of your awards there. I mean, I mentioned before the Ivor Novello, but you've won Basis of the Year, Most Valuable Player. You've even been honoured by US Congress. I mean, that's wow. phenomenal. I didn't even know all that, but <laughs> no, it's a, no, it's it's good fun. Uh, it, you you play and, and you go to work and you do you, you kind of do your best. And if if there's an award that that recognizes that work, it's always uh, an honor. Mm, of course. So, uh, tell me about like some of your your favorite bass lines that you ever wrote. Do you have like? A- oh, well, <laughs> there was. Um, we worked really hard on on the song "Footloose" for Kenny Loggins, and that was a that was a, a line I worked on really, just to get every note dialed in, and and so uh, that won Grammy for Song of the Year, and. Uh, that was fun. There was one called Love Will Follow on, on that, uh, an album called Bakshi Mana by Kenny Loggins. And that was, that was a fun bass line to work on. Um, the song Tears in Heaven, I always say that, that bass, the song played me. You know, I, I was sitting there in the studio and literally these notes kind of just came out um, from, from the heart with where it was, you know, when I listened back, I didn't even remember playing it, but I always say the song played me, you know, that's why I changed the world was a fun one to, uh, to try to try to come up with uh, something that just, you know, with, with bass, you gotta, it has to be interesting enough, but simple enough that you're not getting in the way of, of what's going on on top of it, the melody or vocals. Um, so it's always a fun challenge. 101 Eastbound, uh, from foreplay was a, was a fun one, and and uh, and probably most recently was get lucky uh, to uh, you know just to kind of work that one out. Yeah, it's, it, it's been fun. And so, when you're like writing those bass lines, are you thinking in terms of theory or or anything, or you're just listening and kind of vibing off it? Pretty much just trying to vibe off of it, you know. Just again, something that's going to be interesting but still accessible and so not not too flashy maybe or uh, it it's just the for me the base is always the the first responsibility is is sort of lay the foundation you know along with the drummer so like if you're building a house you know the bass and drums are the concrete you know and, and so we're you know i'm not really trying to to to, to overplay but then not underplay. So just keep it interesting. Come up with something that's that's uh, that's accessible and and basically just feels good. Um, that sounds like great advice. I mean, yeah, obviously. I mean, just serve the song, really. Serve the song, yeah. And, and it, it's um, it, it's something that to this day I still work on. You know, I I start by just listening and, and imagining what's the best what's the best. Uh, thing for the for the base for this song and mm-hmm. and you know we have so many great examples and models of people that have come before us james jamerson paul mccartney you know where birdie and white from earth wind and fire where the bass is really just that emotion that that it gives you um and and these these have become models for me you know on, on what a good bass line should be mm-hmm. carl radel Jack Bruce, uh, I mean, so many people, Ron Carter, um, just the Peter Soter, Rocco from Tower of Power, Jaco Pastores. I mean, there's been so many great guys that have played this instrument uh, and, and a wealth of, of knowledge of, of how to approach it. So what those those guys mentioned before, they all have influenced your playing then? I think so. I, think, I mean, even, even Stevie Wonder, I used to listen to his records and uh, Nate Watts was playing bass, but sometimes Stevie's playing synth bass, you know, and, and the, the bass is just so good on those records. And um, mm. so sometimes I I hear that influence in my playing as well, you know. Uh, I even yeah. say, what would Jamerson do? What would Stevie do? <laughs> <You know. laughs> so how would you describe your approach to playing bass? You know, 
when when I'm asked to play, I always say, I just want to bring some love to the song, you know. So I, I just call it bass love, and I try to I try to caress the song and and create something that makes the big picture uh, just a, a little brighter and look look better and feel good. And uh, so I I'm not really trying to attach my signature or, or anything. A, a lot of times I'll, um, I'll do a track and then, you know, maybe the producer will say, Oh, just give me a little more. Give me, give me some more energy. So, but I always start very simply and just try to, you know, again, what I was saying before, just lay a, a, a solid foundation um, for what's going to go on top. Now you had a, a DVD a, a, a while ago called the business of bass. Um, so was this kind of like, why did you decide to really staff it that DVD? Was it kind of like a guide how to in the ses- to be a session player? Or yeah, the, back in uh, especially around the nineties, there were a lot of um, then then there were lots of DVDs, and I mean now everybody goes on YouTube, but there were there were a lot of kind of DVD programs, and and I thought oh it'd be fun to just say this is one approach and, and take people behind the scenes to look at some of the things that I had been doing. Um, so it was it was more, you know, coming from an angle of giving you a peek inside of, of my world. Now now I do um, have an online school of bass over at artistworks.com where um, we actually have a lot of curriculum up there and then we do video exchanges where our students send in videos and then we send videos back critiquing their playing or positioning, uh, what have you. And uh, it makes it, uh, it it makes it fun just to, to, to connect with, with the world of musicians out there. And are there any, uh, you know, players, younger players that have come out um, that you, that you love their playing? Like, is there any in particular? Oh, man. Um, well, there's a lot, you know. Actually, Jacob Collier is one of my new favorites. I mean, not only is he a great writer and pianist, but his, his bass chops are <laughs> pretty, pretty impressive. Um, you know, Esperanza Spalding is one of my favorite musicians uh, mm-hmm. and singers. Uh, Justin Lee Schultz, who I think is, I don't even think he's 13 yet. He might be 13 already, but he's playing a mean keyboard, bass, guitar. I mean, he's one of these guys that just like, God just touched him and and um, so, yeah, I look uh, on uh, Aaron, the bassist, of course, is, <laughs> is blowing everybody away. It's always fun to see his his posts playing bass. But, uh, yeah, there's there's a, a whole list and slew of new new uh, players that I'm really enjoying. And what advice would you give for, for people who want to go into the... Well, I mean, I say the word session mu- musician and it, I, I, I know it has a different meaning from when it used to, like it used to mean more in a studio, but now kind of, to me, it means more like a touring session musician, you yeah. know, like a hired gun. Like what advice would you give for people wanting to go into that world? Well, first of all, it's, it's a different world now and I'm not a hundred percent sure when I do clinics at some of these, um, like Berkeley College of Music or something, where we're like 200 amazing players, you know, and the first thing I say is every one of you is better than me. And, um, but you're going to have to use your genius to figure out when you graduate, how are you going to translate that, that into you know, making a life for you and your family? Um, are you going to be able to sustain you know, decades by doing this? We all love it. But the challenge is uh, is actually figuring out how to turn that into uh, turn that into a living if you if you want to pursue it as a living. And mm. uh, I think every musician knows how challenging that is. Nobody's following you around with a pension plan, and you're also, you know, sort of every gig is like an audition. You're you're also just, um, you know kind of going from one to the next, not really knowing. Sometimes we don't know what's going to happen from year to year. Uh, obviously, 2020 was a, was a tricky year because I know all my tours got canceled and you just watched everything that you do and you're living and and that just come to a grinding halt. 
And so we we became instant entrepreneurs. You know, now what do we do? <laughs> How do we keep the boat floating? And you know, people have families and, and what have you. So it's uh, it's it's a bit of a challenge now. And if if you have the stomach and the guts and the passion for it, uh, those are the people that make a way. And and otherwise, it's it can be it can be a, a rough struggle. So what? How did you cope with the um, pandemic then? How did you readjust? Because it, it was like someone pulling a rug out from under us. Yeah, you know when um, when it when it hit, it was just like I think that the entire world was going, "Oh, what is this?" You know, because probably every hundred years, you know, we haven't seen anything like that where the, the entire planet shut down. And um, but for me, it was instantly. I was grateful for the fact that I I got to be with my family. Um, I keep one or two suitcases packed all the time, you know, so I'm, I'm kind of coming in and out like a revolving door at the house. And it was it was actually refreshing to, you know, I did have all these tours and trips planned, but it was refreshing to know oh, I get to spend all this quality time with my family, something I never would have had. And I think we all appreciated that and, and became closer and so it gave me an opportunity for that, as well as just really stop and appreciate some of the things that are around me that you you end up since we're so busy, you know, you end up missing. And uh, so, for me, it was a it was a bit of a blessing, mm. a big blessing. Well, that's a good that's a good attitude to have, like the attitude of gratitude. I call it, you know, finding the yeah. positive in any given situation. Right. I mean, obviously, I mean. The effects that it had, business just shut down, and it was really, you know, devastating for a lot of people. But uh, again, you know, we all had to go into uh, Plan B. You know, secret of life is how you deal with Plan B. Plan A is kind of a given, but but whenever that's thrown at you, I mean, that's really when you get to see what you're made of. So, is that why you turned to? Like, you know, teaching online and doing more producing at home? Or how, how did you keep yourself kind of occupied? Yeah, fortunately, I have a, a, a recording. I have a little recording facility, a studio uh, not far from my house that I'm able to, if people send me tracks or, or uh, you know, music, I'm, I'm able to produce and keep things going there, which is, which is yet another blessing. And then, um, you know, you, there's time to write, there's time to practice, so, you know, all the things that, you know, when you're, when you're so busy, you say, okay, if I had more time, I would do this. So this was, this was, okay, now you have the time, what are you going to do with it? So, um, you know, I, I know a lot of people that use that as an opportunity to write music, actually record um, albums, sort of virtually sending tracks around. And it, um, you know, again, it, it became time to try to figure out exactly you know how to deal with that uh, all the mm. all of this time at home where we're sort of locked down and can't go anywhere but i bet you can't wait to get back on the road though <laughs> yeah no it's going to be fun I'm, I'm excited at some of the things that are lined up and and when you think about you know how long it's been and and it just makes you that much more grateful none of us knew when we played that last gig before the shutdown that okay this is going to be it for a while a year and a half you're not gonna you know maybe two years you're not gonna be able to do this so um it, it we definitely got um got to be reminded of how precious this gift of that we what we do is how do you keep, keep yourself like you know what's your practice regime if you have one or, or how do you keep yourself kind of limber in the base during quiet times and busy times yeah pl playing is fun um my my son He's been here and he plays piano and then uh, recently picked up the Hammond organ. So we got him on, uh, an organ. And so it's fun. We, we get to play every day together at home. Just that alone is, is, is great you know, because you know, we'll, we'll just go in there at night and start playing. So uh, we, we realized that we're having so much fun that we're going we're gonna to make a duo album together, just father-son. Because it's just uh, it's just too much fun. <laughs> That's perfect. And um, there must be something about being a bass player and being a producer, because an awful lot of 
great bass players turn their hand to produ- producing as well. Do you think there's some some sort of cross connection there? I think there's a big connection. A lot of times in the studio, you know, the producer sort of leans on all of us to to you know ask was it, that was the take, was it a good take, and and so we're we're kind of silently producing from the background uh, anyway. But it's nice to get a project where you can be in charge of, of, of every note that gets played and, and everything that's going to be heard. And I think it is a natural connection. And musical direction as well. Bass players tend to do that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, my buddy Ricky Minor, he's, he's turned into one of the one of the premier musical directors. And Grammys, Oscars, uh, Kennedy Center honors. And, and it's just so much fun to see, you know, um, bass player you know getting getting those gigs here's here's a random question that just popped into my head if you weren't going to be a bass player do you what do you think you would have been otherwise the other thing that i and i really love um i'm a private pilot and every time i'm flying and i go up in the cockpit with the pilots i think to myself you know if i didn't play music this would be the other thing that i would love to do because it's it's almost like um beats working for a living, <laughs> you know, <laughs> obviously it's, it's hard work, but you know, just flying planes around, you know, how, how great would that be as a gig? You also, uh, you have solo albums as well. So tell us about like, how, how do you approach writing your own solo stuff? Yes. Um, it, it, by, you know, after all the years of everybody saying, when are you going to make a solo album? <clears throat> um, finally, you know, about uh, five or six years ago, teamed up with Yamaha Entertainment Group and 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 my buddy Chris Giro who uh, who was with me producing and uh, uh, we were working on those records and and it's just like okay now what did we do we have a blank slate but so we literally you know got a whiteboard out and said what would be great songs and and uh, so picked a lot of good songs and uh, it was a combination of originals, covers, and just songs that, <clears throat> that, that I love that were near and dear to my heart. And, um, again, it's, it's, it's fun. The creative process where you really put a blank slate and you can do anything. It's fun, fun to see what you come up with. So, uh, mm-hmm. that's, that's kind of the creative process of, of that we all are in now as artists that, that where you just, okay, now what do we do? And, and do you start on the bass or do you, play it on the piano or, or how do you like write a song like that? You know, I usually start kind of by hearing something in my head, a melody. And so there's so many different ways, but I'll either sing it into, sing it into a recorder that I can like save the idea or sit down at the piano. All of a sudden a chord will, will spark an idea for a song, you know, so you start with a little germ. Now, most of the time it's just little ideas, even, even if I'm just sitting on the bass and all of a sudden a line comes and it's, I figure out how to, how to develop it. Um, so I don't really have any kind of one way that I write, just whether, because sometimes a song comes to you when you're, when you're sleeping <laughs> or when you're, you know, driving or, or uh, flying, you know, and so just got to kind of figure out how to capture. I have a bunch of ideas on my, on my phone. And you sing as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I was I was always singing in top forty bands too, singing leads and 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 it's fun. I remember when you know when Eric Clapton asked me to sing "Can't Find My Way Home," you know, which Steve Winwood did such an amazing job, and so that was a fun to take a moment to sing that during his show. When once we were at the Albert Hall doing it, and Steve Winwood was actually in the audience. I didn't know at the time. I'm glad I didn't. But uh, yeah, it's it's fun. Uh, another another way to get the the music from from inside out. Do you also think that that's? I I, I was asking Gail actually this as well, Gail and Dorsey. Um, do you also think it's being able to sing as well? It's a, it's another you know string to your bow. Uh, it's something that's attractive for an artist to have as a backing musician. I think so. If you if you're able, I I always love to. You know, approach as you know. I, I even try to sing the bass lines because it's like if, if somebody can sing it, then it's a nice way to convey it. You know, and and 
No, people say, hey, you know that song? It goes like this. And then, oh, how's it go? You know, and then if they, so I always try to think in terms of even if you're not a singer, you should be able to, to sing a song enough, well enough to let somebody know what it is. And you mentioned uh, about, you know, touring and stuff lined up. Are you able to tell us about what's coming up post-COVID? Yeah, post-COVID, we, um, I mean, there there are some Eric Clapton tour dates in the book now for Europe um, and the UK. Uh, and I think if you look on, I, I haven't put them on my website yet because it still was, was if the promoters and if the venues open up, we're going to do these. You know, so... Um, I'm pretty sure, though, they're on, on the Clapton website, and those those are now in the book. I'm also hosting a cruise uh, called the Jazz Weekender Cruise in April of 2022, April 23rd through 30th. So if anybody wants to go to Tahiti with us, um, we're going to have some fun there, and there's going to be a four-play reunion and lots of fun artists. So again, that's, that's the 20, 23rd of April through the 30th of 2022. Uh, cruise to Tahiti uh, Jazz Weekend, oh, hosted well, by my cool. friend Sandy Shore, and uh, so uh, there's a little plug there. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, yeah, that's going to be amazing. And um, is there anything else? That, are you going to like, as well as playing with Eric? Do, do, is there any other tours that you're thinking of playing? Or? Well, I'm thinking if if timing works out, if my my son Noah is a uh, going to be a senior in uh, college up at UC Berkeley. And when he graduates, if timing works out and we make a duo album, I'm hoping that we'll be able to go out and tour that um, in 2022 as well. And, um, you know, there's there's other offers coming down the line for, for my solo band of brothers. And um, Foreplay was talking about, you know, doing some dates. So we're we're all kind of, everybody's putting their toe back in the water now, slowly, <laughs> post-pandemic. And uh, hopefully we'll be back uh, back to where we once were. Absolutely. I think we're going to all appreciate it an awful lot more. I think so. Mm. I think from a, from a performer's standpoint <laughs> and um, an artist, from an artist standpoint and an audience standpoint, I think everybody's going to enjoy being back together. So do you ever go to like any of the big expo shows like NAM or Music Mesa or Bay, London Bay Show and stuff? Oh yes, absolutely. We um, we had a big, our, our last NAM in in beginning of 2020, we had a big show um, out in the kind of the plaza in the parking lot in Anaheim you know, with Earth, Wind and & Fire. And, uh, it was it was magic, you know, 30,000 people there and it was, it was for Yamaha and, and so, uh, it was like going back to our childhood with all those great Earth, Wind & Fire songs. Kenny, La- Kenny Loggins came out and played. So Leia, we had Sinbad host. I mean, it was just great, fun evening of music. My, my buddy, Mr. Talkbox, came out and played. Uh, so, you know, those are moments. Again, in 2020, that kind of got me through the year, the memories of that. And um, that that we do every year at the NAMM show, as, as well as uh, I've played music Mesa in, in Frankfurt. And uh, there's always lots going on. And I think those shows will start to uh, to come back again. You know, this this year, they completely shut down. And mm-hmm. I'm not even sure if they did. Uh, it was a little virtual activity, but, but otherwise, I mean, and that's like ground zero for for the music industry too. You see everybody walking around, Stevie Wonder, and Herbie Hancock, you run into all your friends and uh, it's an exciting time. So I will look forward to uh, when those shows are back on again. Um, so what's like, are you gonna, are you planning a big holiday then after coronavirus as well? Or are you just like mad to get out? Well, you know, it's, it's we're just kind of easing back in. I, I, wanna, I wanna be diligent with you know, how fast we, we jump back out and act like nothing ever happened, you know. And just want to make sure the coast is clear, everything's safe. But, um, you know, that, that year got our, our attention around the world and, and everybody seems to have processed it a little different differently. And, and you know, um, the attitude, I've seen the attitude go from A to Z, you know, about masks and vaccines and, and just the, the virus in general. So it's 
it's been it's been fun to try to keep a level head and just kind of stay stay above water with it, with all of it. And how did you adjust, adjust to all this online life that's been happening this past year and a half? Yeah, it's um again, it was an adjustment. I'm still not a you know, familiar with all the things that Zoom can do and it's like we we were thrown into this sort of a Zoom world, but in, in a way it's it's kind of cool because um a lot of these interactions where, you know, there's eight hours, nine hours time zone changes, difference and 6,000 miles between us, but it gives us a chance to still be face to face and, 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 and have a, a dialogue together. So I, I think that's the good news. Um, the better news is, is when we can do it in person. Yes. Yes. Hopefully, um, I'll come catch you when you're playing over here or, or in London or meet you in Nam or something. That's, that's the dream. That's the dream. And uh, what what part of Ireland are you in? I'm in a town called Rohada, which is for, it's near Slane Castle. You probably would have played it. Okay, <laughs> it's uh, an hour north of Dublin, roughly. Nice, nice. Yeah, but it's countryside, well, so it's beautiful. Been a lot, it's beautiful. Yeah. yeah, there's been an awful lot of jumping in the freezing cold sea and hiking and all that. I'm going camping at the weekend. You know, you know, normally I wouldn't get a weekend <laughs> off. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, the times that I have visited Ireland, I've enjoyed it immensely and uh, consumed a little Guinness while I was there. <laughs> you have to. So, it has to be done. You have to, yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's been great. It's lovely. Lovely country. Brilliant. Well, Nathan, thanks so much for joining me today. Uh, it's a pleasure, Ellen, and uh, good good speaking with you. And, and uh, just to hope everybody stays safe. Take care and we look forward to uh, getting back out there in person. All right, everyone, you can find out more about what Nathan's up to at NathanEast.com. Nathan, thanks again. Cheers. All the best.